we've looked at almost every aspect of why your flat tap at camshaft could have failed and the things you can kind of do to prevent from happening in the future. But the last area we need to cover, well, that's a big one, and it's lifters. So we got a lot of detail on this one. Let's start unwrapping it all. Before we get started, let me just make one thing clear. This video is not going to address every single issue or combination of issues that could have occurred that would cause a failure. So just keep that in mind. But I'm going to give you a lot of little detail on a lot of things that can affect what happens to the lifters in the relationship to the camshaft and the engine that it's in. And we're just going to talk about all those things. So I'll, we'll talk about some the the common problems and some of the solutions, but just be aware from the get-go here. It's not going to cover every little detail of it. I'm just going to give you as much as I can. And uh, if there's any other information that's needed, well, you can leave them down in the comments below. I'm happy to answer them for you. Let's talk about a couple of things that we talked about in the first two videos in the series and, and just kind of generally go over why do camshafts fail or why do flat tap of camshafts fail. And I'm going to give you these in not any order. There's not one that's any more important than the other. They're all very important. But one of the big ones I see is mismatched parts. You buy maybe a, a melling cam and you put summit lifters on it uh, or whatever combination it is. They've got to work together. It's just kind of like anything else within an engine. If they're not designed to work together you're going to have problems too much spring pressure this is a big one and it is certainly where i see a lot of people complaining about that they wiped out a camshaft in in a big block chevy like this one is uh, or whatever the case may be it's because they didn't address the spring pressure they used the springs that were designed to use for the camshaft but they didn't take the break-in process uh, into consideration. So we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a minute. Improper break-in is another one. Certainly not every engine has the same break-in RPM and procedure. They are different. Again, this is a big block Chevy cam. They require a little bit lower break-in RPM. It's a very common misconception that you have to run it at 2200 up to 2500 and, you know, kind of vary it, whatever, for that 20, 25, 30 minutes. Not the case on a big heavy valve train engine. They needs to be broken in a little bit slower. So 18 to 1900 is really all you need to work on there. So again, another big piece of it, wrong oil. Uh, or playing chemist and mixing your own concoction, buying an off-the-shelf oil that doesn't have a lot of zinc additive in it, and purchasing a separate additive and throwing it in there. We'll talk about that. And the lifter bore issues is the last one. It's a it's another really big one here that I haven't seen a lot of information on, and it's what's taken me so long to put this video again together. So again, those are all very critical. There's maybe a couple other little tiny details, but we're going to talk about all that together. But let's talk about some history first. So when the OE cam manufacturers in the U.S. moved on from a cast cam core onto a billet camshaft, it was based on the demand of the OE. You've got a couple of really good cam core manufacturers in the U.S. Most of them are in Michigan, but they all are designed to feed the OE. Well, when the OE stopped using a flat tap at camshaft and went to a hydraulic or a roller type setup, it changed. And so they stopped using making cast cam cores now they still made them for you know other things here and there but the volume dropped and their main focus was to concentrate on a 5150 or a 5160 billet type of material that will work in conjunction with a hydraulic roller so these are an afterthought for them and there's only i think one maybe two manufacturers left in the u.s that are still making cast cam cores so all of their focus has gone to hydraulic roller and these are dying out pretty quickly um, now potentially you could still see some of these come from offshore but from u.s made manufacturers the demand is dying out for it so it's one one of the part of the the considerations when you think about where this is going and how all these things match up together now lifter manufacturers are in the same boat they're, they're making more roller lifters because that's what the OE is demanding. And when there's such a high number and a high uh, or a big contract with those OEs that's going to net a larger amount of money for uh, creating a lifter, 
uh, they're going to go with whatever's going to keep the money in the pocket. And if the OEs don't want to flat tap it, they want a roller, that's what they're going to concentrate on. And a flat tap of lifter is an afterthought for them. That's the other side of it. So the demand is still decent, but the supply goes down, and that's another issue. So those once OE lifter manufacturers ha had to make a decision. Do they make a lifter that nets them more money as they sell it and supports their biggest customer in the OE? Or do they make a flat tap of lifter that drops less money into their bank when they sell it and the demand is down and it doesn't support what the OE wants? So all important things to understand about the history of it. But let's talk about now about the quality of lifters because I think that's what people get stuck around the most. I'm going to give you my opinion on this. I've got no empirical evidence to back any of this up. It's just the way I view it and how I've seen things develop over, well, the last 10, almost 20 years with flat tap and stuff. I do believe that the quality of the lifter has dropped. Now, again, that is just a seat of the pants feeling. I can't back it up with anything, but that's my assumption is that the quality of the lifter has dropped. And when you are making less of them and you care less about it, I can see that where possibly that the, the quality of the U.S. made lifter has fallen off. The second issue here, and it's one that always people jump to immediately, that that when a camshaft fails, well, it must have been made in China, and that's the reason why it's garbage. I don't buy that because I know that there's quality product that can come from that country. It just all depends on what the uh, importer has demanded from that. We talked about that on a live stream not too long ago uh, and discussed how uh, those uh, manufacturers overseas can make that product. And they're fully capable of making a high quality product. So anytime you see a, a, a white box brand, a house brand, potentially it has a much bigger chance of having an offshore cam core or lifter in it or a, a completely ground cam uh, and a, a offshore lifter in it just understand that when you drive the price down on something something has to suffer and you have to acquire these products cheaper to make that retail price lower and still make enough money to continue to operate and going offshore is the easiest place so anytime you see those those really cheap white box or, or inexpensive house brands, it could be a possibility. Now, not all lifters are made in China. Quite a few of these lifters, and as far as I know, because I know the brands that these were, these were all made by a U.S. manufacturer. Quite honestly, two of two of them. Uh, there's two different ones that are still making a lot of flat tap and lifters. And knowing where these came from, I am almost certain that all these were made in the U.S. But they're all completely trashed, as we can see. So it's it's part of understanding it. Now, do you, if you're looking to buy a lifter or a camshaft, um, there's a couple of easy ways to find out what they are before you purchase it if that's important to you so if you really want to know that ask the retailer uh, whether it's a big uh, brand that sells a ton of things uh, if you go on amazon and put in a part number of the cam you're looking for a lot of times in the specifications they will list the country of origin that coo and maybe uh, I don't think Amazon puts the harmonized tariff code on there, but if you really want to, you could call up your favorite uh, retailer and say, hey, I want to buy this camshaft or this cam and lifter set. Can you tell me what the country of origin is and the harmonized tariff code is because I'm going to ship them to my buddy in Canada? And they have to give that to you. The declaration has to be made by the manufacturer of what the country of origin is. So that's one way of doing it. And then, like I say, you can look on Amazon and potentially you can see it there as well well too but again just because something's made in china doesn't mean it was automatically junk so let's take a look at some off-the-shelf lifters that i purchased singles of and let's take a look at them individually because we'll talk about some details of the lifter and how, what makes them good or bad here are five lifters that i purchased off the shelf they were just what they had in stock i didn't really pick or choose anything but i think it gives us a good cross section of ones that are out on the marketplace and ones that i think people talk about fairly frequently so what i'm going to do is i'm going to 
take these out of the packaging. I'm going to mark them so I remember which one is which. Uh, but as I'm taking them apart, I want to show you a couple of the packages here and what's on them. Now, this is a Melling lifter. They've been out forever and a day. Part number is fairly uh, you, not unique. It's uh, the 817 that everyone seems to use. But if you look, it says that this is made in Mexico. Now, is that important to you or is that an issue? Well, I don't know. I mean, if it is, knowing that that lifter is made in Mexico may be important to you. The seal power lifter also uses an 817. It's really what they all kind of gravitate towards, uh, keeping them consistent, but made in China. I didn't know that about the seal power lifter, but again, because the volume is so low with some of those lifter manufacturers, it's easy to see why these two manufacturers have gone outside of the U.S. to purchase the lifters. All of the other ones that I have here don't have a country of origin listed on there, uh, so take that for what it's worth. So let's go ahead and break these out. Again, I'm going to mark them, and then we're going to talk about them individually. The first thing that we want to look at on these lifters is the chamfer. Now, all of these lifters are the same. The only one that's a little bit different is this is the CompCam Pro Magnum series. It's the 858 lifter, so it's a little bit different than their 812, so it does look a little bit different. Now, let's talk about the chamfer, because that is one of the biggest ones that, that there's an issue with uh, mixing and matching. So the tolerance should be around 15 thousandths. And this is really difficult to see, so I will get some close-up shots of it. This one happens to be the speed power one, and it's got a pretty wide chamfer. I'm going to say that that's probably much bigger than that 15 thou. Um, this is the Melling lifter. It's a little bit better. Not great, but it's not bad. Let's look at the Summit brand. This is the widest chamfer I've seen on a lifter in quite a long time. That is really bad. That's worse than that uh, sealed power one. The comp one, as expected, it's very, very tight. Comp has always been very, very cognizant of that chamfer and having a really, really thin one on there. That's probably going to be the best one. Uh, Crower kind of is a little bit more than the comp is, but not by much. So I would call the Crower one probably okay. It's certainly not as bad as that awful Summit one. So honestly, this one is a little bit um, on the wide side, but uh, uh, it's probably pretty close. Let's talk about Lifter Crown next. Now, if you remember in the interview uh, that I did with Billy Godbold, we talked a little bit about Crown and taper on the lobes on the cam and how they have to work together. So that's why I say you can't just uh, have whatever camshaft and then have a, a, a machinist or or take and uh, use a, a dial indicator and measure out what the actual crown is on that and decide that you're going to have these ground down when they don't match the camshaft. If they don't match the cam, it doesn't matter how perfect you made the crown on the lifter. If it doesn't match the taper on the cam, you're in big, big trouble. That's where, where you get into trouble on mixing and matching. Now, I don't have a little dial indicator, but I think there's some YouTube videos out there uh, with some folks that do it. You just take the dial indicator, put it in the approximate center, and then move it out towards the edge, and it'll tell you the variance, and it will give you the crown that's on there. And that's a pretty good way of doing it. Again, I just don't have that set up here to do that. But what we can do is we can look at the how these look from the top side. And if you remember, again, I think Billy and I discussed that in the interview of what the tops of these lifters look like. So we're going to show you each one individually, and then we're going to talk about which one's best and which one's worst. So again, we'll just keep them all in the same order, and we'll go right down the row. From that conversation with Billy, he wanted a nice swirl on the top and not a uh, machine marks that kind of come to a point which he called a cone head so let's take a look at these individually and we'll see what the, that pattern looks like if it's a nice good swirl then we should see that now this is the speed pro and <laughs> this one has exactly what billy says that you do not want and that is that cone head or pin head <laughs> face that's on that lifter that is not by the definition of the expert himself of what you want. So we'll get close-ups of all this, but uh, uh, Speed Pro, eh, you're not really doing very well. This is the Melling. 
Now let's take a look and see here. This one has a little bit better look, look to it. It's not completely uniform. It's got some differences in it. Apparently that is how they machine it. And as the lifter spins through there and the face is ground on there and they add the, the correct crown to it, that looks like what it's supposed to have on there. Let's take a look at the Summit one and see what it looks like. Now again, the Summit one is kind of the same way. You can kind of see that it's almost like it's almost like it's got that, you know, that pinhead style uh, face to it, but it's not quite it's not quite as bad as the the seal power one is, but it's pretty bad. I don't think that I would run that. I think I would be pretty awful um, hard pressed to use that without taking somebody to you know, correct the chamfer in it and uh, <laughs> put a better face on it. Uh, but that Summit Lifter is pretty doggone awful. The comp one should set the standard here, so let's take a look at it, and it does. Remember, this one had the grid chamfer on it. This one's got that nice, uh, uneven little swirl mark in it. doesn't come to a point in the center. That is a very, very nicely ground lifter. I suspect that the Crower is going to be pretty close to the same and it is. The Crower one is a very, very good quality lifter. I did notice that there is a ring on there. Hopefully you'll be able to see that when you get a close-up of it. Uh, I don't know exactly what that's from. It potentially could be uh, because it's a multi-piece deal. Um, and that's the way it was ground. I don't know. But as far as the chamfer and the crown look, that looks pretty good. So that's some examples of stuff that we just found off the shelf. Now remember, you're trying to get with the lifter here, with the right chamfer on it, with the right crown on it, you're trying to help facilitate the rotation of that lifter in the bore. It's a big part of the reason why lifters fail or, or uh, you know, succeed is how they interact with the cam and how they act, interact in the lifter bore. So some of these are pretty good. The comp and the crower kind of set the standard. Um, you know, the melling one isn't horrible. Um, the chamfer is just a little too big. The seal power ones, eh, I don't know because of that crown that I would use it. And that summit one is god awful. There is no way I would use that in anything unless you're looking for a potential failure. If you have used that lifter and it succeeded, eh, you got lucky. So now that we have kind of an idea of what that looks like and what some of those things are on the marketplace and some lifters that you can kind of count on being correct, let's take a look at the last little thing here. And it's a kind of an important one in how these interact together, and that's the lifter bore. So let's get an engine out and we'll start looking at bore and we'll start talking about all the details here because there's some really super critical things here that I don't think anybody's talked about yet. Here's why lifter bores are so critical. The tolerances on a flat tappet lifter between the bore in the block and the lifter are actually much tighter than they are on a roller uh, hydraulic or a solid roller lifter. They're actually a little looser on those. They require that tight tolerance because it needs the, the clearance and the oil and everything else in between it to help facilitate that spin. If it's too loose, which a lifter bore can be, remember, you're, it's a wearing piece of that block. Just like the cylinders wear and you have to rebore a cylinder or sleeve a cylinder to get it back right and put an oversized piston in it, lifter bores are no different. And I think this is one of the biggest overlooked things is the tolerances that are left in the block with the lifter and how they interact together. The other one's one thing that we don't talk about too much, and that's core shift. Core shift can happen long after it's left the manufacturer, especially if that block has gotten heated up uh, excessively too much, and some of those uh, bores and locations have shifted a little bit. Now on a, a, a cam profile with where the cam goes, uh, with the pistons, uh, with the lifters, some of those can be corrected fairly easily. Camshaft alignment's not one I think that anybody checks, and I don't believe really many machinists actually take the time to measure the lifter bore either. But if that engine has got excessively hot, there is a potential that that core could have shifted a little bit and it will alter where that lifter rides onto the lobe. 
pretty big deal, if you ask me. Um, again, you, you want to make sure that that interaction between the lifter face and the lobe is correct. So again, it facilitates the spin, allows them to wear in properly together. They don't overreact and allow the lifter to dig into it. Uh, there is a lot of detail here that you should be asking your machinist to make sure that they check the lifter bores and if they would to give you a measurement of each bore and what the tolerance is between that and the body of the lifter. When your machinist checks that, he has to check for excessive wear. If they're out of round or oval, if they're scored, if that core shift has occurred, you know, any of that overheating has happened. Those are easy things for a machinist to do, and they're questions that you should be asking. Now, the tolerance between that lifter and the block, I think, is pretty universal. Now, this is one thing that I'm not exactly sure on. We're going to measure some lifter bores here, and I've got a Pontiac block, like I said, that's here. Uh, this should make this pretty easy, but a Pontiac is the, is the same as a small block Chevy. It's got a, a 842 uh, on the size uh, of the lifter. It's the same physical diameter as a small block and big block Chevy. Uh, so that's what we're going to use. We're going to test that. So let me get the gauge set up uh, and I'll get it zeroed out for that measurement. Uh, bore, bore gauges are pretty simple. Um, any machine shop should have this. Um, they're going to use this anyway, uh, depending on the range of the uh, of the gauge uh, for uh, the bore and to measure any taper and all that. You're doing the exact same thing with the lifter bore. You're going to measure if it's out of round or oval or tapered or you can kind of do all, all the visual. But putting an actual gauge on there so you have the tolerance difference between the size of the lifter, the diameter of the lifter, and what the actual bore size is is very critical because, again, you want to have that ability to facilitate the rotation of that lifter and, and make sure everything's good. If it's too loose, then you might need to have to drill that thing out and sleeve it. Um, blocks aren't that expensive anymore. Um, you know, a small uh, and big block Chevy is still fairly easy to get a hold of. But if you've got something that's odd or very rare, you may have to drill it and, and bush the thing to get it to uh, correctly to make sure that you got good clearance on. So let me do this. Let me get this the gauge zeroed out and uh, let's take a look at that Pontiac block and we'll kind of look at some measurements and just kind of see how that looks. Once you have that bore clean and you have the dial uh, set and zeroed out properly for the size range of the lifter bore you're working on, then you can start taking measurements. Now, these are fairly sophisticated instruments. It takes a little bit of time to set up. But again, a good machine shop should be able to do this very easily, provide you all of those clearances per hole if you want it, and let you know that the lifter that you have and the clearance on the block and the lifter bore is correct. And it's just like anything else, you're going to measure it in a couple of different ways, a couple of different patterns. I usually just do it in an X, just make sure that you don't get into the oil galley that feeds that hole uh, or that bore, and you should be just fine. So this one checks out fairly good. Uh, the clearance is fairly tight. It's a usable uh, bore, and then you just kind of move on to the next one and all the way down the line. But it's super, super critical, and I think for sure this is the one that probably bites people the most. Why do I say this one is the one that I think is probably the, the worst offender here and the one that hurts people the most? And really it boils down to when people have a failure, uh, the first thing we want to do is go on the internet and say that brand X or Y or J or M or C or whatever uh, wiped out my whole engine, camshaft went flat in three minutes and destroyed everything. In having those conversations with them and trying to figure out why it happened, it's one of the first questions I ask. Did your machinist give you a clearance for each one of your lifter bores? The answer is, I don't know. I don't remember. Well, it's something that they should. And if they didn't, it could be part of the problem. Now, I'm not 100% saying that's the reason why. But again, when you start adding up all these little factors in a really bad lifter design with a pinhead with a really big uh, chamfer on it and the everything's wrong about that and you've got too much clearance you're using too much spring pressure all of those things come into play and this one i think is probably the most overlooked one i don't recall seeing a lot of people talk about this when they're trying to help people understand why their camshaft failed 
oil gets talked about quite a bit and what brand did you use and sometimes spring pressure gets talked about but they always talk about well i did everything right i had the right oil i had the right break in rpm and as you start breaking it down you realize that they've got maybe one or two or even three or four things that they just didn't do right. And that's where the problem comes into play. And the lifter bore clearances, don't overlook that. I think that is probably one of the biggest reasons why camshafts and flat tappet cams fail is because that lifter bore clearance is way out of whack. It's oval, uh, it's scored, it's just gotten worn over the years, it's a high mileage whatever engine, it's got a big heavy valve train that's putting a lot of pressure on that lifter. It's a, it's a, it's a big one, so I want you to take that in consideration. If you're having your engine machined and you're going to run a flat tap of cam, make sure you tell your machinist, I want to know what the clearances are for the lifters I'm going to use and what the tolerances are or the clearances are on that block need to know that i need to have it in writing of what it is because that way you'll know they actually took the time to measure it make sure that they're correct we talked about this quite a bit in the first video but spring pressures are super super critical having the correct seat pressure and open pressure so the cam doesn't see too much during that break-in period and i don't mean break-in period by the first 20 or 30 minutes that's just part of it i'm also talking about that extended period where you're running that engine for two three four hundred miles with break-in oil in it and really light spring pressures to allow that cam time to do what it needs to do to marry up with that lifter and not destroy itself this is a triple spring lifter for that big block Chevy. If you have a big block, or any engine for that matter, and you've used a triple spring on your break-in, you are opening yourself up to an awful lot of heartache because the chances of that failing are super, super high. Now on the seat, I want to look at probably under 100 pounds of pressure. 80 to 100 is good. Open over the nose, you're looking at less than 200. If you can get it down to 150, 160, 180, somewhere in there, perfect. But that means you're going to have to take some springs out of it. You may have to use a lighter spring. You have to make sure that you get the installed height correctly and understand what the pressures are based on that height. It's all super, super critical. And I know it's a big pain in the butt to do it. And yeah, we didn't have to do it 30, 40 years ago, whatever the case may be. But you can argue that all day long. But if you want these to live today, you're going to have to get those low seat pressures. And that means putting on a set of cylinder heads and then doing a break-in. And then once the break-in period is over, initial and that extended, you're going to have to change the spring so you get back to the pressure that that camshaft needs to get the performance out of it that it wants. So don't take that, you know, for granted. It's not something you can kind of baby it and it should be okay. No, it won't. Yes, you've got to keep the operating RPM low during that break-in or that extended break-in time, but on a big heavy valve train like a big block Chevy, to use this triple spring on there is asking for failure immediately. And I've seen this over and over and over again where people have tried to break in a camshaft, something bad happened, and all they want to do is blame the manufacturer. Must be a Chinese core, the lifters are junk, they're Chinese. Well, it's a combination of things that you probably did wrong. And I know you don't want to hear that, but I'm just giving you all the details. So spring pressures are super, super critical on break-in. Last little thing we're going to talk about here is break-in oil. Now, we talked a little bit about it before. Uh, I covered that extensively in the first video on this series. Uh, I did an interview with Lake Speed Jr. where he talked about break-in oils. I interviewed the folks from Driven Racing Oil. I will link all those videos down below if you'd like to, to watch those. Uh, they're vlogs, so uh, there's not much video, so you can play it in the background. But break-in oil is critical. Don't take an off-the-shelf API oil and put a zinc additive in and explain expect it to work out just fine. When you have a high detergent oil and you throw zinc in there, the detergent is going to attack the zinc. It's just a simple part of chemistry. When these oils are blended at the manufacturer, when Driven blends these, they don't just all get dumped into a giant vat and get whirly, you know, desked around or whatever, and it's blended and it goes together into the bottle and it's good. 
They start with the base oil. They heat it up to a certain temperature. They add whatever part of the additive package is to it. And they may change the temperature and add the next thing and the next thing. It's a long process to do that. So when you put a zinc additive into a API oil and just dump it into the crankcase of the engine, it needs to get to a certain operating temperature before that oil is going to, or that additive is going to mix with the oil. So again, you know, don't, don't play chemist. We talked about that quite a bit with Lake. Uh, and we certainly talked about that with the folks from Driven. Uh, when you play chemist, you're setting yourself up for failure. So those other videos will help you understand it. But a good break-in oil, this is currently what I'm using in the GMC. And I use Driven break-in oil for everything that I use. Again, that wasn't a perfect end-all, be-all list of things. What I wanted to try to give you is just some basics of some things that you can do to help make sure that that break-in on that camshaft lasts, and it lasts for a good long time in that engine. Can flat tappet cams still have a successful life? Absolutely. There's probably hundreds that are done every day that are broken in that are just fine. You get a few of those that just don't make it. And there's plenty of reasons why. Certainly, I think if we want to talk about the big ones that I would certainly be uh, the most concerned about is the spring pressure. A, make sure that the b block is ready for it and that it's not going to turn into something horrible with, uh, with you know, how it rotates, the lifter rotates into the bore. Make sure you got that critical. Make sure you're buying a good manufacturer's camshaft. I say that with a little bit of an open, open mind, but again, I would not buy anything that's a house brand. Uh, it's just not my style. You're going to potentially run into more issues. That's all you're trying to do here is mitigate the risk. Do a good risk assessment of what are all the problems that you could experience and how you can do to kind of correct that. If you do that, if you take all the necessary steps, you're going to have a much higher success rate than you are if you just slam the whole thing together and hope and pray that it got through okay. Again, that's a, probably a good strategy for some, but uh, I can't remember who said it, but uh, hope isn't a strategy. So I hope that answered some of the questions. This is the last video in the series. I may do a couple of little short brief ones here and there to talk about it, but I think for the most part that covers some of the major things that you can do as a consumer to make sure that your flat tap at cam gets broken in, survives, and hopefully gets down the road good enough. If you've got any questions on this one, and I know there's going to be some spicy ones, but please keep it respectful. Uh, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have, uh, but certainly uh, leave your comments below. If you had a bad experience with any one of these issues with spring pressure or whatever, don't hesitate. Tell your story down there if it could help somebody else make sure that their, their project stays alive. That's a good thing. So anyway, uh, I hope you guys like that series. It's taken me a very long time to do, to collect all the examples, to make sure that I had the right tools, to make sure that I had everything that I needed in this series. When we cut apart the camshafts uh, to check the heat treating, that's something that I'd never seen done before. And I wanted you all to see that instead of just talking about this camshaft is heat treated, it's fine. I did a test on it. It should be okay. I used the scribe on it. Everything's fine. I wanted you to see that. I wanted you to see what the result is. Talk about all these things individually because I don't think it's been done yet. And I just want to give you a good resource so you can make sure that yours survives. So anyway, I hope you guys had a good uh, time with these videos. Uh, I certainly enjoyed making them. And uh, if you've got any ideas for anything on this type, type of topic that you'd like to see or anything that you'd like addressed further... As far as flat tap it can break in, please leave it down below. We'll try to get to it. We'll catch you guys on the next one. We'll see you.